Let's see. Do a quick sound check. Make sure that sound's coming through. Make sure that sound's coming through. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's see. Title is good. We're all set. Through my checklist. We are all set. All right, nothing new on Twitter. Fonts are good. We got chatty going. Great. Um, we could add some music. I keep getting takedown requests for this music, even though I have rights to use it for this. So hopefully that won't be an issue going forward. But here's some Carl Franklin music to code by. I'll keep fighting with YouTube about it. All right, so this week... We are going through clean architecture, and let me just start my treadmill. All right, so we've been working on a few of the uh, issues, especially this feature request use cases organization and uh, some, other, some other related issues in here with the, the goal being to provide a more realistic set of uh, starting points for how you're gonna organize the code in this template. If you're not familiar with clean architecture, it's an approach to organizing your code that's uh, a lot like hexagonal architecture, ports and adapters, onion architecture, etc. And it mainly involves breaking things up into three projects inside your solution. Um, I say three, but you see four on the screen. That's because this shared kernel project should typically be its own separate NuGet package that you would update, you know, separately. It would have its own solution. It wouldn't be part of your main application solution. Um, and so those three projects are going to be core, which is your domain model, which everything else depends on, and that's where your interfaces and your entities and things live. And then all your data access, so your email sending, your file access, all that is going to live inside an infrastructure project. And then your front end, whatever that might be, in my case it's ASP.NET Core, um, lived, would live in this last project. That's your UI project. Hey, Fasani, how's it going? Um, and I just call you Fasani instead of Fadi because it's easier. Uh, all right, so if we look at the readme for this thing, um, it provides some overview of, you know, how to get this thing started and how to get going with it. Uh, I should probably... Okay, no, that's good. Um, I don't know what this goo is. That probably doesn't need to be there. Let me fix that real quick. Um, goo. Yeah, okay. Goo. Scott Goo was uh, in there attacking my readme file. There we go. All right, so um, I've opened this up to show that there's a Visual Studio template, which hasn't been updated in a little bit, but that's one way that you can get started. And the other way, which I want to update today if there's time, is with this clean architecture template. Uh, and so if you install this using the line right here, uh, then you can use .NET New. And with .NET New, you just say .NET New, clean arch, uh, or arc if you prefer, uh, dash O, and then your project name. And what that will do is it'll substitute in your .project name with you know your company name and your project name, as you can see in this screenshot here. So um, this will save you a lot of time renaming namespaces in, inside the, the template. All right, so if we look now at the, the template source, um, I'm working in this project aggregate branch. Uh, I believe all my tests are still passing. Yep, all right, everything is built. I guess that doesn't prove the test pass. Let's wait for the tests. Uh-oh, functional test failed. Maybe that's where we left off last week. Um, these are all archived on YouTube, so you probably are watching it from there if you're not one of the handful of people joining me live here in uh, April 16th when we're recording this. Um, so you can go check out the other two 
previous streams that I did where I started this refactoring, and it's taken a little while just because there's a lot of pieces involved in, in making these updates. Alright, so in here we've got this uh, to do items controller list. It's supposed to return some items. I expected three actual zeros, so we'll have to figure out A, if we even need that anymore. I think I might have gotten rid of that controller. Um, maybe not. No, not for the template I didn't. That was for something else. So we should still have that controller. And then B, why is it not getting back what it's supposed to do? So let's go look at that test. And at the very least, we want to fix one thing that's been bugging me for a while, which is it should really say returns three items because it's expecting three things. Um, but it's returning zero, so that won't really help us. So let's go ahead and just debug this test and see what it's doing here. I think the issue is that it's fetching the project now and not the to-do items. So we're going to populate the database and that should be fine. We can go into that. We can see that yes, in fact, um, it's going to create a project with one, two, three items in it and then save it. So we should have that. No exception, host starts up. Okay. Then we're going to try and go get the thing. Let's step into that. And we're going to create a project by ID with item spec. So it should have the items. And we say, you're in the project. Look at the project. Has items. There's three items. All right, that's all good. So, and that's an example of using our specification. So there's a, a project that uh, Fadi and I have been working on a lot this last few months which is uh, on GitHub and NuGet called rdallas.specification. Um, and that's what this is. So we're creating a specification that says what is the um, type of data that we want to return. Uh, in this case, we want to get back the project aggregate, which I haven't shown you yet, but I will. Um, how do we want to fetch it? Well, we want to fetch it with its ID, which for now I've hard-coded as one here. Um, and do we need to bring back anything else with it? Well, in this case, yeah, we're going to bring back uh, all of the uh, items that are part of that project. And it looks like we just got a whole bunch of people joining. So that's awesome. Welcome, welcome. Um, we're just trying to fix a test right now inside of uh, clean architecture. So we did this, and that has three items. And my test said it was expecting three items, but it got zero. So... I'm not sure why that's happening. We'll find out in a second, though. I did say step over, so... Alright, step over. Hmm, I bet it's this DTO right here. That's what it is. So I'm trying to deserialize it into a to-do item, but what I got back was a to-do item DTO. So this response here shows me I did get the data. Um, but when I try and deserialize it into the wrong type, because I fixed that at some point, now my result... Oh, it does have all three. All right, maybe I'm wrong. All right, so now the test just magically passes. That's interesting. It didn't pass before. I do think this is wrong, though. Let me see. This uh, client get async that was in to do items controller. That was right here. We did return back an action result with items of to do item DTO. So I definitely do want to use to do item DTO in the test. Which was here. So I'll just fix this. Even though it's working because they have the same structure. Alright. So anyway, let's go back now to our tests. And hopefully they all work together. The other thing that could be an issue is a lot of times when you're testing integration tests or functional tests like this, uh, EF, when they run together, they break. See? There we go. It's breaking. Um, but if you run it individually, it runs just fine. Which is a frustrating thing that I run into frequently with this. So all by itself, it's fine. But uh, stepping on one another amidst other tests running it breaks. So what can we do about that? Well, 
we could run our tests in sequence, which might be useful. Um, we have this custom web application factory, which should be building out the app. I think we're just using an in-memory database for this. Let me see where that is. Yeah, here's our in-memory database. Now, I'm using the same in-memory database name for every one of these, uh, and that can be a problem where they step on each other. So a better approach here might be to give it a GUID. And I'm not sure if that'll fix it, but I think it might fix it. And these tests used to work, so... This isn't anything related to what I've, or shouldn't be anything related to what I'm trying to do today with the whole aggregate thing. Nope, that didn't do it. In fact, now we've got a whole different error. 500 internal error. All right, so let's uh, let's debug this again. All right, I'm confident that still works. And that's the right route. So let's step into that. Let's just see what our error is. Null reference. So project was null. All right, why would project be null in this case? That means I don't have any data. All right, and this is even just running all by itself. Five two was null. Interesting. All right, well, this is obviously not going to work. So let's go back to our factory here. Why would forcing it to use a new GUID every time for the DB context cause it not to have one when I'm running it all by itself? Right? If I just run this test all by itself, it blows up with that null ref. Seeded once, not getting a new DB all the time, so it needs to be seeded each time. Well, let's go look at that again. I wish this weren't so long and we could see it all in one place, but this is configure web host. Configure web host gets called where? Not in here, called separately. So create host. I can't remember if one of these calls the other or not. I thought they did, but I'm not seeing it. So this is configure web host. Where's that called? Override. Use solution. Configure. Right, so this says rip out the DB context that you have and instead use this one. Right? And. This one says, build the thing. And I think when you say builder.build, it's going to use this builder. I want to say, um, it gets the services, gets the app DB context, which should be using the in-memory DB context at this point. Get a logger, populate the database, tell me if there was a problem. So it should work. CLW, nice to see you. You're in a meeting or you're in Magic the Gathering. Audio is muted. Well, you can't even hear me then. All right. So this will start the host. This is weird. Because this worked fine before when it said that. All right. Is there anything special about that? Let's search for it. I don't think I have anything else, anywhere else in the whole app that's referencing that name. But when I use that name and I run this test, does it work? It works fine. Of course it does. All right. 
And we come over here and we say, well, let's make this anything else. Let's just tack on a GUID. Run one test. Now you get a 500. Yeah, that's weird. So, if we, yeah, I'm at a loss for it now for why that's breaking. GUID contains dashes and you think they're not... No, I know I've used this before, but that's fine. Um, what's a better way than a GUID to make sure this is unique every time? Any ideas? I can go a dot replaced. Two string, dot replace. How about that? You can see me any happier with that? Empty character. Yeah, no kidding. That's what I want it to be. Why isn't it like empty characters? I don't know what's up with that. Now you're happy. All right. Just put some integer counter. Yeah, but where am I going to keep the counter? Do I have to have some static global that has that? doesn't care but it blows up here it doesn't blow up there so let's see what happens when we step into it all right so we'll debug debug let's see if it actually hits the seed method maybe that's the problem somehow all right so populate tests let's go into that and Save. Okay, we create a new project, we add these items, save the changes. That all works. That's all fine. What is this app DB context? What can we what can we see about it? Context ID, that's that's not the connection string. Is there database provider name is in memory? It's not gonna show me what that string is though. Yeah, so here's the in memory, and it definitely just added these things. Right, so that's all good. So then we jump on forward. Everything's fine. We start the host. Return the host. Okay, now our app connects to it. And we hit this. We're going to step into this. And I'm going to add a break. There's already a breakpoint there. All right, so I could have just F5 to that. We go here, we go here. And now we just created this project. But now it's null. So why is it null? Can I do an immediate? I don't have access to a DB context here. Um, hmm. And so here's where it breaks, right? Because project is null, which it should never be. We definitely seeded it with the right thing, right? I didn't tell it to have an ID of one, so maybe the ID isn't one for some reason, but that was all working before. And it works fine when I change the. Uh, uh, the type of the name of the memory database, right? That's just weird. So someone is asking, Junicus, can you see the internals of the underscore repository? Yeah, sure. What do you want to see? I've got a repository. It's got a DB context. It's the same DB context, right? Um, context ID, database, facade, shows that it's actually an in-memory database, which is what we expect. Non-public members. Um, I don't know. It's, tell me what the name of my database thing is. I don't see where that is. But I don't know why it would matter. 
Um, here's the, all the projects. Let's go look at all the projects. Expand results view. Empty. All right, there are no projects. So this in memory thing has no projects, even though the other seed data thing did it. Yeah, I was going to use interactive, but I don't actually have a DB set here. But uh, but I was able to get to it just the way I did here. So so yeah. So for some reason here, when it creates this controller, it creates this repository, injects in a DB context, it's not the right DB context. And I think I think what must be happening is that somehow this one is not the same one. Like we seeded one and then we used another. And as long as they had the same name, it worked. But as soon as we said, so this must just be getting called multiple times. So let's verify that by putting a breakpoint on it. How many times does this get called? So let's stop this, come back to here and debug our test again. I was thinking that would only get called once because that would make sense. So we hit it once. We step on over that and we got whatever value we got. That's fine. We continue. Seed the database. Okay. Continue into there. And now we hit it again. Now why are we hitting it again? Why are we configuring the web host a second time? That makes no sense. Could you use interactive? Do I do C++? I haven't done C++ in a while. Chad of Suburbia. Um, could you use an interactive and get all the data in DB set? I just did that, and it's it's empty. And we know why now. It's because uh, the one I seeded is not the one I'm looking at now. It be it's in scope, and it resolves the DB. It gives you a new instance for the scope that isn't populated. It's possible, but that shouldn't be what it's doing. The real issue is, why is configure web host being called multiple times? Is there a way to see the stack trace? There's the call stack, right? So what's I would like to expand this call stack, please. Factory of startup, anonymous method. Yeah, that's not very helpful. Um hmm. Let me go to the docs and see what I can find. It's been a while since I wrote them. All right, so here's here's the relevant doc on how this stuff works. Um, I wrote the that ASP.NET Core 1.0 version, and we're on the ASP.NET 5, so things have changed a bit since then. But we are looking at Customize Web Application Factory, which was introduced in 2.0. Hey, Hegel Hansen, how's it going? Um, and basically it says, override configure web host, allows configuration of the collection of your services. So there is how we do the thing. And then this is, you know, create the thing and then initialize the database. And it's basically what we're doing. And so in my code, which has been upgraded a few times, I have configure web host and it does those things, right? We can stop this for now. Um, but the other thing mine has is that create host. So why, why do I have both? Do I even need both? Right? Maybe that's a, a relic of how I used to do things. Okay. So this is saying basically that this is all I need. And for whatever reason, this code has worked for years. Um, but suddenly today has decided to give up the ghost. So if I didn't override this at all, and instead I did this work down here, maybe that would work okay? Maybe? Because this says to do it this way. Let's. I'm going to bring this down where I can see it at the same time, and we'll try this real quick. So... 
configure web host, find the thing, remove the thing. All right, so this code is all basically the same as what theirs has. In fact, they're in memory DB for testing. That's literally, that's this code right here I took from them. But then they have all that service provider stuff down here. instead of over here. So they do this. Let me just get this out of here. Get a service provider, use the scope, create scope. Yeah. So take all that code and put it right there. And they say services.build service provider. Right, which I need that too. So where's, I need that. So we're gonna do that. Well, instead of being host.services, it's gonna be services.create, no, build, build, service provider, bam. All right. So that is better. Um, let's see if this fixes it. So now this thing becomes nothing. And I probably don't even need to override it at this point, because I'll bet it's going to do this anyway. So let's, let's copy, let's comment that out. Let's see what that does. All right. That is the fun part, I think, might be having an issue. You create the DB in that scope, but then when it goes out of scope, it's probably disposed. Right, exactly. When you actually run a controller, it gets a repo with a brand new instance. Yeah, I I was just looking at the, um, what's this called, code lens on this thing. I didn't even create this, or if I did, I wasn't the last one to touch the create host method, so I'm not sure I needed it at all. Um, but hey, let's run our tests again and see if they they work at all. No, let's see if they work by themselves. Wake up. One test. All right. now it could be that the docs that literally say do this, that they have issues as well. So we'll see. This is not an uncommon problem. Client options, inject services, set the environment. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else in here I need. So we'll get this out of the way. All right, let's go see 500 server error. Let's debug. I swear this worked the last two weeks though. I'm gonna look at my old YouTube videos and show me running my tests and they worked. So what what changed? All right, we're gonna hit this provider once. Where's my seed method? Where's my seed method? So we'll hit it, we'll seed it, we'll call an API endpoint and we'll hit it again, all right? Why do I wanna hit it again? I'm supposed to have one there should be one of these things per per test, I want to say. And this nukes the other one. So after having already created this one and configured it, it wipes it out. Right, let's go back to the way it was just for now. And this way, it will use the same one, but it'll also use the same one for parallel builds, which I don't like. And what is this purple line? No. Right, let's get rid of that. Yeah, I don't like that this is getting called twice.
Right. Agle says, do a get reset to 14 days ago and see if what changed? I, I know nothing changed. I'm in my own branch. I didn't even do a get latest from git, so this is my local. I'm on the same computer. Um, yeah, the in-memory DB gets created like a hash table. Yeah, it's all, it's all just stored in memory as objects. That's why things like uh, eager loading and stuff don't work uh, properly, or lazy loading don't work properly, because it's, it's all just there. Do I have a global JSON? I don't think so. No, I don't. And I could be wrong about it working. It's possible I did all this stuff and didn't run these tests before, but I don't think so. All right, so we're using a single named in-memory context, which we're keeping the name. So if we seed it once, we hit it again, it's fine. The real question that's bugging me now is why is it getting run twice? And also, if I run all the tests, is it going to work now? Still no. Still zero. All right, so something gets disposed between some other test run and this one running and it dies. So this one just loads the home page. I mean, there's only three of these things total. This one just grabs the version. And this one's supposed to do that. If this one runs first, it's fine. But if those ones run, they must dispose the context or something. New SDK could new, you don't have .NET 6 installed. Um, and we can create a version, a global JSON with a locked in version. But, uh, I'm on that. And I'm in here. And that's my branch. That's my functional task. And so I should be running this on 5.0.202. And the same thing, right? Same behavior. Loka Samasta Sukino Bavantu. That is quite a name. Enable add more verbose logging. Uh, I would love to. Um, how would I do that? I guess I could add a. I have not tried to add more logging to. Uh, to. Uh, my test before for like EF to see what it's doing, which I guess is what you're saying. Cause I can't really do much logging in there except uh, inside this custom web app factory, I could add some logging. I could do like console writes or something. Um, but if I want to configure logging for EF in here, uh, that could be a thing I could do. Let's see. Let me just Google that real quick. So someone says on Stack Overflow, blah, 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 logging. Logs show all this stuff. No, 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 none of that worked. Try using a filter. Try adding ASP.NET JSON. Okay, so it's saying whatever I put in the actual app is gonna override it. It's interesting. I guess that makes sense. So I could tell it, I'm not going to use console, but I could just crank up my logging. Um, am I specifying its contact or an environment here? I usually use an environment of testing. All right, so if we specify the environment, System under test environment. Set the environment. All right, so looking at this, you can say set the environment, configure environment variable, blah, 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 use environment right here. Da, 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 da. 
override the environment when using set the ASP and core environment variable to whatever and then override this. Right, I know I can lock it down so it doesn't run in parallel. Um, and that might help, right? The, the thing is, none of these tests, there's only three tests, right? None of them are deleting any data. So the issue has to be that this is getting called again, and this is not, I think, right? Um, is there a way to debug all of these tests? I don't think there is. Let me try it. Debug all the tests. Honestly, I haven't tried this before. So while trying to debug all the tests, like if it runs in parallel, is it going to let me step through three different threads at the same time? Or is it going to, it's going to serialize them into one, right? Alright, so my breakpoint's in the wrong place, but that's fine. So it ran this once, seeds the data once, hits this again, seeds it again, calls my thing, meanwhile hits that again, runs that, hits that again, seeds it again, and that's it. So it kind of worked, but this blew up. And so it seeded it like every time. If you're using an NX unit collection, it shall share your fixture. All right, well, let's just make them use a collection uh, in X unit. All right, so this can be collection sequential. That's what I usually use to make it sequential. We'll copy that. And we'll come over here. We'll paste it there. We'll go over here and we'll paste it here. We'll go to tests, we'll run all the tests, and we'll see if making it sequential works. Because in that seed data method, it does wipe out the data. So it's possible that while one seed data method is running, the other one's trying to read the data, and that that's the problem. But even sequential, this just failed. But if I run it all by itself, it runs fine. All right. This is the fun of dealing with EF core. So I have other projects where this works, I'm pretty sure. So let me see if I can open one of those. Should only run a constructor and dispose once or their async variants. I like to use name of and point to the connection fixture. Tell me what that means name of connection fixture. I don't know what you mean by that, Hegel Hansen. Okay. Here's my factory. Here's my fixture. How do I get to that connection? Collection, connection. That's not helping me. Fusing. Autocorrect on your phone. Sorry. If you're using an X unit collection, then they should, you're right, all right, I point to the collection fixture, okay. But the name of my collection fixture is the web application thing, right? Like this is the factory I'm getting. It should be specific to each class. Right? I should get a new instance of the factory for this class for it to run. All right. So I guess the real question that I still have, and I think if I solve this, I'll solve everything, is why does configure web host get run multiple times for one test? I don't want that. How about, nope, I don't want that either. Um, let's try, I guess I'm happy with, I guess I'm happy with just that. All right, so let's Google. Web application factory configure web host called multiple times. 
And Google says, implement an alternative to an ASP.NET Core issue from October. Yeah, yeah, okay, apparently it's by design. This guy's using a vet clinic as a sample. <clears throat> Name of collection fixture. Could you replace the DB context with a singleton? And for these set of tests, you always get the same instance. I could, but I don't want to because that would be bad because some of them might change the data. And I want each test to have its own set of data. Um, let's see. It's not the kind of thing. Right, when running integration tests, this gets called twice. So we get hit twice when running web application factory, right? Okay, it shouldn't run twice, no. Never call build service provider, it messes up DI. Yeah, I've, I've read that before too, I know that. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, I remember this came up because I was linked in on this. I filed an issue to tell us to clean up our sample, right? You did. And then it sat here and it's still open. Yeah, so here we were talking about this and the docs also say do this, right? And we had this conversation six months ago. Okay, so now we're back to why we override create host. Which causes other problems. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Agal. I'm not sure why we're just bouncing into this now, but it does seem like that create host method that I was using was because of this issue in the past. And Tratcher insists that we should never, ever, ever create our own service provider, right? So we should never do this because it's just bad um, and it'll be a separate service provider from the one that the app uses uh, and so you don't want to use that whether it's program.cs or in here um, but unfortunately the docs still say that's how you should do it right even though I proposed that that get fixed here six months ago um, And he, he says, this is, this is what I can do. Right, so we should never recommend this pattern of, of creating duplicate things in a separate service provider. And people said, fingers here said, provide a modified example on how to rewrite the code without calling this. Okay, and he says, well, if it wasn't a test fixture, move into program main between build and start. Service collection's already there. The app hasn't started yet. For a web app factory, it looks like you need to override iHost. Which is okay, we had that in there. And put the logic between build and start, and it should look like this. Okay, so the mystery is becoming clearer. Maybe this is why we overrided the thing. Application factory. What are you linking me to here? Create host. Okay. All right. He says override this and do it there. So we're back to that. Um, so fine. Let's undo back to 
Yeah. All the way back to here. Okay, so here we're going to override create host. We're going to ensure created, see the database. Let's let's break point on that. And Junica says, I was thinking another crazy thing, but not sure it might work. How about adding interface to DB context with stuff you want and register a resolver for it that gets a required service DB context and runs a seeder for it in the test. So each time you get the interface, you get a DB context that is seeded at the DI level just for the test. Um, I think I see what you're saying. And so instead of seeding it when the app starts here before I run my test, I would have something that would try and get the thing and it would run the seed method the first time it was hit. Um, that would probably work, but that seems kludgy. Now, my question here is when I had this, there was some other weird behavior going on. That's why I just tried to move it around. But it still had to do with it being called twice, right? Uh, and that's the end issue, is that it gets called twice. So, create host. We say, go get me the service provider that's already been built. I'm not building one, so that's allowed. I say, go get me the DB context that's already been created. Ensure it's created and populate it. All right. And we can check out Contoso University. All right, I'm game. on GitHub. Let's see what he has. And he's got source and he's got tests, but his are integration tests. So no, that is what I want. That is what I want. Um, integration tests. So he should have a custom web app factory in here somewhere. No. No. Container fact. I don't see a web app factory in here. Get his latest one. This should be the latest one. Does he have multiple? Oh, the .NET Core one. Okay. Contoso. Uh, does it have tests? Integration tests. Okay. Test base. Doesn't do anything. Slice fixture. I don't know what that is. This doesn't look like it's using the any of the built-in test stuff. There's one that ends with pages. Something with pages. Okay. Fine. Done at core pages. Integration tests. Same stuff. And he's still not using, and he's using a real database, um, which is fine. But yeah, I know he uses Respawn. I've talked to him on my podcast about it, but that doesn't help me trying to use the standard ASP.NET Core integration tests. So let's run this now. I just rejiggered it to be this way. Let's see how many times we use this in-memory database for one test. All right, so we're going to hit our one test. We'll debug it. And we'll be curious as to why we hit this multiple times if we do. Because it should configure the web host once. There it is. And it should seed it once. There it is. And then it should hit the thing. And then it shouldn't do that. Like, why is it doing that? And this has to be because of the scope? Maybe? This add db context is a is scoped, not transient. Um, 
This options call, though, to make this an in-memory database is a method call, a lambda, that's going to get called again the next time it needs to create one of these DB contacts. And this will get passed in as a parameter to the constructor for its uh, DB options. Right? The DB options builder will build the options and it will have the in-memory option. Um, why is it getting called twice though? Because it's not, hmm. The whole thing isn't being called twice, just the, the lambda, I think. So let's see, this is gonna work because I'm using the same name, right? Well, let's run this again. Oh, I know why. I know why. All right, I figured it out. I don't know how to fix it, but I figured out the problem. Um, in here, when I say, get me this guy right here, this will fetch an instance of the DB context once. And then when I get in here and I say, give me this repository, which needs a DB context, it will fetch a DB context again. All right, so I understand what I need to do. So when I get into here, and I want to create this string, I can't create this string every time in this in here. That's the thing I'm doing stupidly. I have to create it here. So uh, should I call it in memory collection name equals good dot new good dot and the reason is that this actual line of code right here, this this config option, gets executed every time it creates uh, a new instance. And, and that's happening multiple times because I've got one of them being created right here when I ask for it. Um, so yeah, so if I just use this, so it's not dynamic in the life of one test, then I should be good. All right, so now if it calls this multiple times, it's going to use whatever string this was set to when the app started. Uh, and just to verify that, let's put a breakpoint here and here. And we'll just verify that that GUID doesn't change um, when we hit that. All right, so now let's come back here. Let's debug this one more time. So if Fadi's got an example of how he's worked it out for our other package. I think I've solved this one now. So we go there, we say, all right, our GUID is 702 alpha. And we set it there, then we go get an instance of it, and we grab it again here, 702 alpha, continue, and we seed it, and we call it here, and we get it, a th this looks to be a third time, but that's okay because it's still 702 alpha and we get our repository and we get our spec and our project is not null so we continue and our test passes yay all right so now we try running all of them that was a 45 minute long rabbit hole that we just fixed and i don't know why it was broken um, I do know now why I broke out this into its own thing, and that was for this, and that was because of that thread here. Um, so I'm going to reference that so I remember next time. And so let's get rid of that, and let's say overriding create host. Uh, to avoid creating a separate service provider per this thread, because Tratcher said so. All right, and let's go ahead and commit that. Um, fixing up EF core in memory tests, which broke for some crazy reason. <clears throat> All right, and we will pull down my changes and push up my changes and be good. 
All right, now where were we? We're trying to add aggregates to this thing. Let's run it because we haven't run it in a while and see what it looks like. Shoop. And here's what it looks like. And we should be able to load the project and that doesn't do anything. We should be able to show it and there it is. We should be able to look at it in Swagger and we should see endpoints, endpoints, controller, and then other stuff. Um, this API to do items I might get rid of because if you're working with aggregates, you don't necessarily want that. Um, so we have to think about that. When we go and get the project, which we don't have a get for yet, um, let's try this one. Try it out. Project one, what do we get back? We get back the project, but we don't get back any of its items. So that's a question, right? Should we get back the whole aggregate when we fetch a project in an API or not? It really depends. Um, usually, if nothing else, you should get back the IDs that are in it so that you can then go fetch those if you need them. Um, but in this case, let's say, sure, we'll just return the whole aggregate. So I'm going to make a get aggregate for endpoints, and I'm going to change up the behavior from this one to make it so it returns the whole thing. All right, so what does that look like? Um, we need to go find our endpoints for project, and there's a get by ID here that apparently wasn't uh, showing up, which is interesting. Um, so question, with this you would still need to be careful with multiple tests. We still run into a possible issue that the previous test changed the data. Uh, no, because <clears throat> no, because the call, like I did, I did run multiple tests, um, and the call here that was setting, uh, where is it? I was setting the name of this collection. Will happen per test, is my expectation, right? So this should be set. Uh, for each individual test run. Now we could verify that, which we should do. Um, but that's that's what I understand to be how it's working. All right. Now the next question I have is when I look at this one, and it's saying get a single project for get by ID. Uh, this is not showing up. And I don't know why. It seemed to have to do endpoints though, right? Like, what's going on here? There's to do endpoints for post and get, and there's project endpoints. There shouldn't be any more to do endpoints, so that must just be that I didn't get to changing things. So let's find all these. Okay, this doesn't exist. That's interesting. Like to do item endpoints, that's why I'm not finding it. All right, so this should be project endpoints. So I'm using tags like that. That one's right. And this one should be project endpoints. Yeah. Just copy this whole line. That's my DTO, and that's project endpoints. All right, so let's try that. Justin, how's it going? Good afternoon. Okay, so let's go back to Swagger. And now we have project endpoints, and we have these old other things. Um, that's not right. That's totally not right. So I'll have to fix that. But these look right. All right. So we say get, try it out, project ID one, create, bam. Okay. So now let's make that return an aggregate. So I'm going to go back to get by ID. Now I'm going to say it's response is project response. Um, and it's going to be right there. And it's project response just has an ID and a name. Let's give it a list of items. So do I have items somewhere? I have to do item DTO, so that'll work. I have project DTO in two places. I don't like that. I have a record type and I have 
this other thing. And I have this project response, which is yet another different way of doing it. Um, I wonder if I could use a record here. Where is this one even being used? I don't think I'm using it. So let's go here. Let's just make that use a project DTO. curious what this serializes as. Alright, I'll build that and see what we get. Uh, nope. Alright, we switch to that. That should be alright though. Um, I just have to say project equal new project All right, that should be fine. Okay, and then all this is going to do is nest my JSON one level down, I think. Get, try it out. Um, project ID name. Okay, that's good. I like that. Uh, now if we do list projects, it should look similar. So what does list look like now? Where is list? Put post. I don't have a list. Oh, there it is. Get. Okay. Try it out. Execute. Projects. Alright, so it's the same. Good. Um, now I think when you get, this is why I did it that way, I'm remembering from last week, when you get a project in a list, you want it to be just the, just this, right? Just the ID and name. Um, but when you get it with this response, you want to also have its items. So when we get its items, I can't use inheritance on a record type unfortunately. So the question is, do I put the items next to the project or do I abandon this and go back to how it was? I think I have to abandon it. So I think we're going to go back to ID name and the items, right? So we'll just do public list of project, uh, no, to do item DTO, which is not here, but it could be. We can make another record type for that. Let's do that. So you have those things. Let's go over here. And right, pull all that out of there. Put this into its own file even though it's one line and then over here we can do that like that right what don't you like oh, you need a name items and maybe a namespace right okay so now when I create that response and I probably want to create a request too um, but this has to go back to the way it was. Doink, doink. And instead of doing get by ID async, now I need to go get it with a specification. So this ought to be var project equals await repository dot get by spec async uh, and pass it the spec, which I don't have yet our spec equal new project with items project by id 
worth items back. Something like that. Hey, I got it right. What keeps you using Visual Studio instead of Rider? Um, inertia. I don't know. I haven't installed Rider. Is Rider free? Because I get Visual Studio for free. So, there's that. So VS Code is free and Visual Studio is free to me. Um, I don't have anything against Rider, I just haven't used it. Alright, so I'm going to project, response, instead of... So that, that, that becomes that, and that becomes that, and the uh, items equals project.items.select new item new what do we call this to do item DTO screwed up my formatting here. Uh, as an MVP, you get it for free. Okay, yeah, that's probably true. By the way, do I have a license agreement with Carl for playing the music code by on a stream? I do, in fact. Um, he has given me permission, but unfortunately, he also just recently started some streaming thing with something called CD Baby, uh, and it keeps trying to enforce its copyright on my YouTube videos for some reason. Well, yeah, I literally was just talking to Carl this week about it, and he was like, that's weird, because I totally put that out there for, for it to be free. I should put that email thread in my stream. Like, like here's literally what he said. So, yep, this is him with, uh, that was me asking about the thing that was asking me about uh, takedown requests. It's like, so I shouldn't be getting these takedown requests? I'm like, uh, not sure. You shouldn't, because I did it so you could get it for free. Like, well, it's not working. Um, but yeah, no, theoretically I have the rights and it should be fine. Okay, where do we get here? This thing wanted to take in a constructor is the problem. Uh, that's my mistake. So it needed to be item.id, item. .id, item Title, item dot description, item dot is done. That's what happens when you switch to record types. So that, and then probably a dot to list on the end. Right. Um. It looks. It looks right. Cool. Okay. So let's see what that looks like when we run it. And now it's in the wrong window, but that's okay. Because we can just refresh this one. Oh, it doesn't like that. Show me the errors. Okay, well, that's not helpful at all. Um, let's run somewhere where I can see the errors better. There's that, and I'm, I'm going to hit it in another window. Oh, it's on a different port now. Eh, what port do you want? 57679. Probably a conflict in the endpoints. I would agree, but let's see what it says. 
it's going to tell me unhandled exception, fail to generate operation for action, to do items controller post, see inner exception, clean architecture to do item DTO, can't use do item DTO because it's already being used at do item DTO. Yeah, I gotta not reuse the same names, otherwise, it really annoys Autumn Swagger. Which is fine. Um, let's say. Let's just change these to record, since they're actually records, and that'll resolve it. Rename record. You're not smart enough to rename the file. I bet Ryder would be smart enough to rename the file. But you can also do it from this side, and you can do F2 record. And then, does that rename it everywhere? I think it does. Yeah, so there. As long as you do it from Solution Explorer, it works. Yeah, I know Ryder's better for some of those things. I used to use her sharper religiously, but Visual Studio is almost good enough. It's not building. There we go. I told it to build. It ignored me. All right, that should have fixed that problem. So let's just jump back to here so I don't have to keep closing the window. And we'll run it. And now it's unhappy about something else. Go put your kids to bed, Eggle. <coughs> All right, so here we are. Let's try it one more time. Yay, okay, everything works. Um, we get... Why are we getting all the to-do items? Why is that in project endpoints? That should be something else. But okay, let's just assume that it's right. Try it out. Execute. There it is. All right, that's my list of projects. Notice it does not have the items in it. But if we get a particular project, and we try it out, and we use it with one, and we say execute, we should get the project and its items. All right, so that's nice. I like that, because now my API gets the right amount of data back based on if I'm getting a list or if I'm getting in the details of one thing. All right, so that list endpoint has some issues with its swagger stuff, so let's go look at that. Because it still says there to do item.list, and it should say project.list. And all these things are wrong. So this should be projects, projects, projects. I can't really search for to do item because they're supposed to still be to do items. Um, so that looks fine. And I can get rid of that. All right, so let's look. Create creates a new project. Creates a new project. Uh, to do item create no project dot create. And new project request. Create a new project, create an item, save it. All right, so we can write a test for that. So the stuff you're working on is a sample app you get with your clean architecture template. Yeah, it's not meant to be an actual sample app. It's meant to just be like examples of how to do things that you throw away and replace with your own stuff. <clears throat> and it used to be just literally one class. It was like a to-do item. Um, but I got a lot of requests in my issue list, which I don't have up, but somewhere here, issues. Folks were asking for like how to do other things, um, like this one, like organized by feature was the main one. And they were like, hey, you could do it like this and have this aggregate with these things in it. And I agreed, and I said I should do that. So I created this branch, and that's what I've been working on. And so this other stuff is all sort of ancillary to that because um, when you turn on the uh, – when you start using an aggregate to organize things in your root, in your core project, which I haven't even shown you, but up here – Right? I've got this project aggregate, and it has events and handlers and specifications. Well, it turns out that this has implications throughout the whole rest of your application. So that's why it's taken a few hours to, to get this working. And Evan says that I have a Star Trek shirt on. And uh, is that coming back this year? Yes, uh, it is coming back 
in virtual form only, alas. Uh, but I don't think too many people are ready for an in-person event anyway, myself included. Um, but yeah, there is a virtual Stir Trek May 7th, so not quite a month away. I should probably work on my talk. Um, and it's single track and it's all virtual. So here's, here's the schedule, 10 a.m. to 4, um, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 speakers, 12 sessions. Um, and here you go, Let's see what you get. Um, we are considering doing another event later in the year that might be a hybrid event or an in-person event. Um, and we're hoping that in 2022, if the vaccines all work and everything, everything mostly goes back to normal, um, hopefully we'll have a, a regular event. Also assuming that, you know, theaters still exist. At least if we want to keep our usual... Uh, venue of, of being in a movie theater. Okay, <clears throat> um, so that's that's that. Let's write some more API tests, which will do a few things. Um, do, do, do. It will verify that our tests can run in parallel now with the changes that we've made, which would be good to know. Um, so let's see, let's organize this a little bit better. So we're going to add a new folder. We're going to say control Controllers, it's the home page. The home page is a, an actual page, isn't it? Home controller index. Do I have a, I do. Home controller returns a view. All right, so let's name this uh, controller views. All right, and then home controller index, we can just move into there. Which doesn't really change anything except how they're organized. Okay, and then these API endpoints, these are going to be a uh, controller API, I guess. Let's rename on that. Controller APIs. All right, so this will be that and that's going to be distinguished from API endpoints that we're going to add and then we're going to fix the spelling of because I can't type is it API to do items or did all the project work you did change what is tested well this still exists on this control to do items controller. So the question is, should I change this to be a project? Because um, right now it's just fetching items, which I don't know that you would normally want to do. So if we make this a projects controller, that's probably better. So why don't we do that? Let's make that a projects controller here and here. And sure, why not over here? Right, and now when we say list, it really ought to be listing projects at this point, yeah? So instead of listing to-do items, this becomes API projects, and I don't need a spec for that. I'll need it later though when I do get by ID, but I've already got it there, so that's fine. Um, this becomes repository.listAsync, and that's fine. And then items I don't need anymore, but I will need a project DTO. So the result equal new project DTO. And yeah, I could use AutoMapper. Um, and we do a list. Oh, shoot. Uh, let's just do what I did before. Uh, project DTOs equals dot list async dot select project new project DTO um, and I'm going to leave out the items I think because this is on the list 
So id equals project dot id and name project dot name project dot name close my select to list return OK project DTS. Now the items I didn't set so they should be fine. Why is dot select not working? Because um, I need to wrap that in that with the appropriate that. Okay. Junicus, could I run a user story by you and see what you would use, or is that too much for the setting? No, go for it. I'll multitask while I fix this stuff up, but uh, happy to read what you got. This is sort of an ask me anything session too. Um, now this one's interesting. To complete a task, do you do that through the project or through the item itself? Um, that'll be interesting to think about. Okay, so then if we get a project, we'll wait for Junicus to do his thing. So, so this should just be the ID at that point. So that's correct. It gets that, it gets from to do item. Why is it one item now? It should be getting many items. It's not getting one. Okay, this is stupid. That's not what I want. Um, I want the project. So I want a new project DTO. So get rid of that. Did my project DTO have a from project? No. Because that might be handy. From to do item does though. Alright, so in here we're going to do basically the same thing. Get by ID async project spec. That's my project. Dot select new um, let's see this this will be no not select let's keep that the way it is okay so var result equals new project dto id equals project dot id name equals project dot name items equals new list of item dto with uh, project dot items. That's not the right type. So how do I cast that collection? I guess I have to do a dot select. No. Like that. Right. And Boom. And then we return a result and we call it a day. Not item D2, it's to do item D2. Now you're happy. Now what about this? Can I convert from enumerable to Items is a collection, right? Yeah, list, new list. All right, so here's my user story. I want to set up a service that receives orders, like restaurant orders, and from the model sent, we determine where it should go. So it's injected into a point of sale at a store. What would you use to get bi-directional communication between the API site and the Windows services at the store? Uh, singing a service bus with queues or mass transit. Sure, yeah, mass transit, RabbitMQ, and service bus, Azure service bus. Some type of queuing system seems to me like it would make sense. They're almost instant, and if the point of sale system is down, you don't want it, your uh, orders to bounce. Um, you want them to just queue up, right? And obviously, if they queue up too much, you want to know about that, so you need some kind of monitoring for it, but. Um, you know, if, if somebody's rebooting the point of sale, then as soon as it comes back up, it reads off the queue and it says, hey, we've got orders, let's go fulfill them. Um, 
and once it reads it off the queue and it tells the the the, the origination system um, your service, you know that they've started work on it. Like right now, when I order pizza from the local pizza place, um, I get updates that tell me, "Hey, we've we've started baking the pizza," and there's you know a, a web socket thing you can watch on their site that tells you like when it went in the oven and when it came out of the oven and when it when the driver left with it. Um, you can even watch the driver like come towards your neighborhood. So you know all that communication could easily just be done over events. I would that's definitely the way to go. <clears throat> Alright, the best overlighted add method list of to do item DTO dot add to do item DTO for the collection initializer has some invalid arguments. What are you talking about? I'm not doing an add method. I thought I was just initializing your items. Is it because I needed the stupid to list? Is that all it is? I bet that's all it is. No. No, that sounds right, Junicus. All right, why am I being an idiot here? <clears throat> Do a select, which is supposed to return some things. Argument null exception. I haven't even run the code yet. How do you know? The oh, never mind. Best overloaded add method. Don't add for initial. There's some invalid arguments. Cannot convert from a list of DTOs to a DTO. This is the list of DTOs. This is one DTO. This is a list of DTOs. Don't you take, you know, have to do. Do I have to do this? I think this might be my problem. I have to do that. Because it takes it in the constructor, not the initializer. Alright, that should work. And this is why Automapper is nice, because you don't have to figure out all this stuff. Alright, get rid of that. That should let us get that project. If we're going to create a project, this is going to look a lot like my create over here. So why don't we just steal that code? The difference is going to be that request. Um, but we go to the projects controller, post. We're not doing that anymore. We're doing that. It's not taking in a to do item DTO anymore though, it's taking in a project DTO. Hmm. Let's do public class create project DTO. Which should not have an ID. Honestly, it shouldn't have the items either. It's just going to have the name. So, there we go. So at that point, do I just ask it for a name? I guess I could just ask it for a name. But if I ask it for a DTO, it'll be easier for it to be extended later and to get it from body. So this could just be string name, but let's call it a create project DTO. We'll say request. Now this will work. Request.name, that works. To do, to do, return, okay. Created item. Uh, I don't want to do that. That's not good. Hold the horses. This should not return the created item. This should return a new project response. What does that have? ID and name. New project response equal created created right.
Yeah, that never should have worked. Curious if CQRS is too much overhead, at least for this scenario. Um, which scenario are you talking about? The one I'm building here for the clean architecture or the one Junicus is asking about? Um, I think it would be too much to add as a default that everyone that would use this template would have to figure out and work with, yeah. So I'm not uh, doing anything to enforce that at this point. Um, certainly you can use, for example, uh, this uses an I repository and it's, it's creating, so um, that's fine. But on the list, I could use, instead of an I repository, I could, for instance, use an I read repository which would make it so that it's a little more clear that it doesn't need the full thing. Um, but that would require me to have defined that, which I didn't do, so never mind. Um, but if I had defined that, that would be a step toward CQRS where I'd be not using this full interface. Let's go look at this interface. Basically, the interface I'm using has these CRUD methods on it, um, as well as the ones that are on here, on read. So if I wanted to, I could create a read one that would only have these. Um, and maybe I should do that. Let's do that. Fine. You convinced me. Um, so we'll just copy this. I may have to break, take a break and go get another drink of water. So I'm all out. So this is I read repository base, blah, blah, blah. All right, so if we have that, then I could go into my list method and I could make this an I read repository and this an I read repository. And then if I implement caching, Um, if I were to implement caching, I would only have to add caching as a decorator on top of iRead repository because I don't want to cache my writes. It wouldn't make sense for somebody to create a project and somebody else creates another project and it gets the cached project that the first one created. Feature creep. Yeah, well, that's why we're doing this on stream is so people can ask me questions and tell me what I'm doing wrong. Um, but also it makes it really easy for me to get lost on what I was working on. So we're over here now. And we're working on this post. And we saw that we're going to return this created item. And I realized that that's wrong because that's actually my aggregate that we're returning there. And we definitely don't want to do that. So we want to have some return type that we return, which in this case will be a DTO. So var result equals new project DTO with ID equals created project. Let's just call that project created project dot ID and name equals created project dot name. And I know it doesn't have any items yet, so I don't need to worry about that. Um, like that, and we return the result. Now this has totally broken my test, but that's fine. We'll get to that in a minute. But this is good. How would you handle cache and validation when new projects are created? I don't think list is the best spot to have a cached repo. Um, you could add cache and validation for when you do any kind of add, update, delete, um, or you just have a short cache duration, which is what usually is good enough. Um, if you set your cache duration to be like under a minute, sometimes even a few seconds, uh, anything that's really, really busy, that's getting like, you know, it's your homepage or something, and it's getting like a dozen requests per second, um, and it's just hammering your database with, with unnecessary traffic that's saying, you know, this, the exact same query again and again and again, 10 times a second, um, put it in a one second cache. And that drops your database by a factor of however many requests per second it was getting. You know, well, if it was 10 requests per second, now it drops it down to one request per second, tenfold reduction in load. Um, and what do the users see? They don't see any difference, right? They, you know, one, one second cache is like instant to the user because most pages don't render in under a second anyway. So by the time the page reloads, they're, they're seeing the result. But yeah, if you do need to actually invalidate the cache, then it, it might make sense for you to put your cache decorator over the whole repository um, just so you can do cache invalidation logic on anything that does an update or a delete or a create, right? 
All right, now we still have to think about how do we want to mark something complete? Um, and that really should be an operation on an item. But from an API standpoint, I feel like that maybe should be uh, specific to the project. So I could tell the project, I want you to mark this item complete. Uh, and so if I pass in a project ID as well as a item ID, then I should be able to have the project go and mark that complete. Um, or at least have the API go and find the appropriate item to mark complete, I guess would be the other way to look at it. Because I don't want to, like, in, an, in a real aggregate, the, the child type might have a lot of behavior. It might have a dozen different methods on it. I certainly don't want every different method to be exposed as a method on the aggregate root, um, because then it kind of turns into this god object with too much behavior. Um, but I could expose it on the API through a patch method. Um, Alternately, I could just have a put uh, that lets you update the the whole project and pass in its new state and say, here, you, you used to have a state with these three items and they were all undone, and now you have a state with two items and they're complete, and it just has to make it work, right? I don't really like that, uh, that level of API, personally. Um, I feel like it doesn't let me do any domain logic uh, to the actual operations that were performed and the order in which they were performed and whether or not they're allowed to be performed. Um, it basically is, a, it's saying, this is just data. You can do whatever you want with the data and I'll just store whatever you send me. Um, and it's not very domain driven at all. Uh, whereas issuing a command with an intent behind it that says, I would like to mark this thing as complete. That's not data driven, that's behavior. All right, so let's do it that way. And let's say, I'm going to have ID int, so it's going to be API projects ID. So this looks like patch API projects ID, and that's really the project ID in this case. Um, let's just put in some text here for fun, and then we'll say item ID like that. And so that's. Well, I guess we'll keep what we had before for our signature. We'll say complete item ID. All right. So then let's make this project ID and make this int ID, item ID. And then these just have to match. So this becomes project ID, int item ID. All right. So now go find the project with project ID with its items loaded up and then the item that I care about is to do items dot first item ID equals that um, let's make that first or default because we want a 404 like that all right so if project equals null return that found all right there's my to do item if to do item equals null return not found can I, can I add a message to this it'd be handy if I could add a string and say what was not found let's try it We'll see if our tests can verify that those things work. All right, so load the project, load the item, mark it complete, update the project, return back the project. Um, actually, don't return back anything. Just return success, right? Return back, okay. We did the thing that you told us to do. I don't need to tell you anything. If you want to know about it, you can fetch it again, All right? So let's do that. And I haven't done that as an endpoint yet either. Um, but first let's just run it and see if it seems to work. So we're going to run this. Hit the docs. We're looking at the project down here and there's our complete. So let's get all the projects. And that works. No items. That's okay. Probably don't want that to show up because um, that could be well, no, it's fine when you first create one. It'll always be like that. Um, 
no, that's not good because this is not one I just created. This is one that was there. So this this shouldn't be there. I'll fix that. Um, all right, let's get a project. One execute. There we go. Four, five, and six are all not done. All right, so now let's try and patch one. Project one item four execute. thinking about it. Oh, it doesn't like that. Oh, that's actually good. It's not sending email. Um, okay, so it did mark it as complete though, and then it failed to do the uh, the mail. That's okay. So let's, let's execute this and we can see, look, it's done. Um, let me run an email server for this. I should probably talk about this in uh, the docs for this. Let me add a quick to-do item here. Mm -mm. Let's verify it's not there currently. Doo -doo -doo. Running it, running it, running it. Where do I run it? Nothing in there talks about running it. Okay, so let's do that. So issues. New issue. And we're going to say add instructions to run the sample for the first time be sure to include how to set up a test email server for when you complete an item in a project submit all right in my case i'm just going to go and run a utility called smtp for dev which is right here and it looks like this and it's listening on port 25 and now if I come back over here and we come down and we say let's let's mark number five is complete execute it shouldn't blow up it should work and it gave us back our 200 success with nothing and this one says look review solution was completed at 416 and then if we re-execute this one, it says, look, review solution is now done. So that all works. So that's good. How would you handle cache? Okay, you asked that Would you have an event to notify to invalidate? Probably not. Um, I would just use a decorator and do the, uh, the invalidation as part of the operation. I don't know why I would use events for that. I would just do it synchronously because it takes almost no time to invalidate. Okay, so that's working. Yeah, Twitch is slow. That's true. Well, it's more about me looking, right? Because I try and focus on getting something done and then look at comments. So probably more my fault than Twitch is on this, in this case. Okay, so let's go back to Visual Studio and let's write some tests. We've got about 15 minutes left. We should be able to test a few of these things. Um, these all seem to work, which is nice. Uh, and that was in a request error in the original mail because mediator notification makes them of sending it. Uh, Runesun, the error that was there before was because I didn't have a, a local host SMTP server running, right? So if I stop listening and I go back to my swagger and we try and complete one of these, number six, execute, it's going to time out looking for a mail server. Because, right, and it tells me failure sending mail, SMTP exception. That's because if we look at the code, there's an event that gets fired off when you complete an item. So inside of to do item, when we say mark complete, it raises this to do item completed event. And that has a handler here that says give me an email sender and send this email. Uh, and so I email sender, if we go look for implementation, it's here in the infrastructure project. It just creates an SMTP mailer and sends it. Runeson, right, but it was a tra in transaction event fire as part of an event, not event emitting and separate subscribe for those kinds of things. Would you typically separate that? It was an in transaction event as fired as part of the event. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, you're saying that my event actually tried to do something instead of my handler for the event actually tried to do something um, instead of just triggering 
another event with some other handler. Um, for something like this, where it's sort of imperative, I'm, I'm just letting it happen in process, essentially. Um, but yeah, you could do it separate, right? The, the thing to think about here, though, is that the email um, and the, the saving of the record are not part of a transaction in this case, right? So there's no, there's no saga or something uh, enforcing that those two things always happen together or not at all. Um, now, it is the case that I will never send an email if I failed to, to mark it complete. Um, so that's good. But, but if I complete it, it is still possible that the email might bounce, might fail for whatever reason. Like in this case, the fact that there's no email server. Um, and so having an event that was persisted that said, you know, a command that said send an email um, that went onto a persistent queue and then had a different process responsible for sending the emails, that would be better, right? And I would do that uh, instead of having this email sender from here, this notification handler, instead of this thing talking to an email sender, this would send to RabbitMQ or, or one of the other service buses and say, here, send a command to send this email, right? And then that's where if it fails, right, I would be able to retry. Yeah, and, and you guys you guys get it, right? Fadi's talking about using the outbox pattern there, exactly. Um, so again, this is not meant to be an enterprise architecture uh, example with everything perfect. Um, it's just meant to kind of show the basics of, of how to wire up some of this plumbing and, and minimal reliance on external uh, dependencies, like a message bus, for instance. Uh, although it wouldn't be a bad idea to add a comment here and say something like, in a real app, you might want to use the outbox pattern and a command Q here. How about that? Um, right. Yeah, and, and this thing doesn't actually use Mediator much directly. Um, it does utilize Mediator to send those events in here, um, if I remember right. There was a time when it didn't, but yeah, right here, it's using Mediator Publish. Um, so that's where it's, it's actually doing that. All right, now you're making me figure out how to ban you. I don't have time for right now. Aztec Consulting, how's it going? How do I ban this person? Oh, there it is. Ban. Boom. Bye. Cool. Okay. Um, tests. Test, test, test. Let's do that. So let's make sure all our tests run. And we've, we've broken some of them, so I'm sure they're not going to. If for some reason you want to mark an item as uncomplete, would you create a new endpoint or would you change this last endpoint to support it? I would, every single time I would create a new endpoint um, because there's probably a whole lot of different business rules for what goes into marking something as uncomplete versus marking it as complete. And so if you have a like update status API endpoint that could do anything, um, that's going to be way overloaded, right? It's, it's, the amount of different ways it might fail, the amounts of uh, business logic that would go into it, the conditional logic that would be involved um, gets to be a, a lot bigger. So by having it be straightforward and, and just a single operation gets a single endpoint, um, we avoid that. So uh, when we're trying to model behavior through the API, which is not always the case, right? Um, but in this example with this thing, that, that's just an example of how you can send behavior, basically RPC, um, through an API. It's not really pure REST um, if you're trying to follow that, um, but it's it's essentially RPC because I'm saying I want to call this method on on this item, right? And so that's that's what I'm doing there. And so if I have a different method I want to call, like cancel or, or you know reset or mark incomplete or whatever you want to call it, um, then, then it wouldn't make sense for it to come in through this API, right? It's not named properly. So I would I would definitely give it a different different one. Now, if there were no behavior and this thing was just a stupid record that, that didn't do anything, then sure, maybe I would just have a put method and I would say put, you know, here's my, my list of items or here's my item, you know, update item number four, 
give it you know this uh, this status, right? And and that'd be fine, right? But in this example, I'm trying to show what would happen if it did have behavior that you cared about. All right, so this broke um, returns three items. This no longer exists. This is gonna just say I have a API uh, projects controller list um, and copy that there and copy that here. And this is just gonna be our list projects now instead, right? And so it'll get a little simpler. Uh, API WAC project, um, and it's going to get back an enumerable of project DTO. And remember, I wanted to get rid of that list of items on there. Um, one title equals C data dot project. I didn't give it a project, did it? All right, let's go to definition. Read on items. Where's my project? Project test project. So public static read only project equal new project name equals test project it really doesn't look like, uh, this does it I should probably give it a name huh That's better. Uh, let me go look at project. Did I not give it a constructor? Uh, it needs a name. There we go. Alright, so then down here I don't have to create it anymore. We can just have test project one, right? Although since I made that static, is that gonna be a problem? Hopefully not. We'll find out. Alright. Which means our test down here can just look for test project one dot name like that, and we should be able to run this. Typically, get that with end update endpoints that you have to determine how what to update. It's simpler to make separate endpoints to handle the cases you want to support. Yep, I agree, Justin. There were build errors. What? No build errors. That should be name. Run. Cool. All right, now I have another NuGet package I might want to apply to this too, but I can do that later. Um, let's add an API endpoint. Let's just do the same exact thing. So we're going to copy this, paste it here, and this will be API endpoints project create. Let's see, project create endpoint. And that's that, that's that. All right, that's all good. Returns three items. No, that's not right. It should be returns. All right, I got to fix it in two places, but the name was conflicting. So this should be returns one project. Okay, and this will be the same. Turns one project. 
API projects, da, 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 all this stuff. Well, that's not right. Because um, the new one is just whack projects, right? So let's run this and see how close we are. It's no longer a project DTO, it's going to be a project response. But it might still build if it can deserialize it. Nope. And what's it tell me? Response code does not indicate 500. Oh. Alright. It is slash projects, isn't it? Yep, there it is. Response. Alright. Good night, Justin. Thanks for hanging out. We're gonna wrap it up in a few minutes. Let's see, we got this working, I think, so we can get rid of these breakpoints. Okay, continue. And you blow up without hitting my thing. So why are you not hitting that? All right, you never hit this. Project controller should be okay. I'd be in trouble if this were projects controller, but it should be fine with project. What about the other one? Projects controller. Um, by default, that might be a problem because uh, slash projects is probably set up in my default route, so I probably broke that map default controller route. Yeah, that's probably my problem. Um, if I get rid of that, then I have to use custom routes everywhere, but I'm okay with that. All right, this becomes, this becomes route slash, which is fine. That's the only route I care about in there. Well, I guess this could be slash error. Right. And then that becomes slash error. Now that should work. Right. Jay the developer, thanks for the follow. Um, it didn't work at all. Default controller routes is no, it's more necessary than I thought. <clears throat> uh -huh. Alright, so that works. And that fails. It's got to be because we renamed this thing to be a projects controller. Um, and my default routes all have controller in them. Mm -hmm. Base API controller makes the, this route the That's why those things were wrong in Swagger. So I got that fixed. Because those are not curly braces. But that doesn't fix my problem with projects running into each other. So I may need to rename this API controller to be like a projects API controller or something. See where this gets us. Alright, docs are still failing. That's not helpful. Okay, and Swagger says ambiguous call. Home controller index, explicit method binding for Swagger. That's not even an API. So I guess adding those routes didn't help me. Fine, get rid of that. 
Get rid of that. Make this go back to where the way it was. Okay. Get rid of that. This is why you build and test frequently. API. All right, so this is my endpoints. And I want slash projects to work. And it says invalid. All right. Then you will resolve service for iread repository. Oh, that's why. I know why. All right. That makes sense then. So we, we added that new interface. We didn't wire it up to anything. Um, and that's not going to work, obviously. So we can go in here where we specify the repository wire up, which is right there. And we're going to wire up the read repository the same way. And I think I can do multiple like this. I think that works. Hunt Jason, sorry my bad. I didn't see what you did, buddy. That's a really delayed uh, response. All right, it does not like this. EF repository does not implement the interface I read repository. Oh, but it does. It does, you know why? Because it implements the other one, which inherits from it. But if I have to do it explicitly, I can. Right there. Okay, how about that? Oh, I got you, it's Hunt Jason. No, that's no problem. I know what you're saying now. Um, it's all good, because I wanted to add that at some point anyway. All right, so now we're here. Now we can get this, try it out, execute. Everything works. Cool. Um, so we want to test that, right? That's where we're at. So let's kill all these things. Let's go back to our test explorer. Let's run our tests. And it's going to work. Maybe. Project create. Project create's not really what I'm trying to test anyway. Um, I wrote the wrong thing. I meant list. I really meant list. So let's rename this. Here we go. But it's blowing up. Why is it blowing up? Um, Um, sorry, I opened up the uh, live coders in the other window to see who's on, so I can see if there's anybody I want to uh, raid when we're done here in a few minutes. But let's uh, see what the error message here is. Couldn't deserialize project DTO because it's actually a different thing, right? So that makes sense. So if we go look at this endpoint for list, it's expecting a project list response, and that's what we need to deserialize to. So we come back down to project list, we deserialize to a project list response, and everything's happy. That's right. And it's not a list anymore. Um, result doesn't have a count, result has a set of projects that have a count and result dot assert dot contains result dot 
projects something, right? And that should let us run that. Yeah, there's never anybody that uh, is doing C sharp type coding at 5 p.m. when I'm logging off of here, so I guess I won't be rating anybody. I just looked and didn't see anything interesting. Um, that passed, so let's just try and run everything. And let me do one more thing if I can do it super fast. And that is, let's see, everything passed, everything passed. All right, I want to fix one thing about my test, so. If we go out here and we look for our Dallas, um, I've got a relatively new thing out here that helps with these integration test checks, HP client test extensions. So let me grab this um, and we'll just throw it into here. Packages, blah, blah, blah. Give me that. Add it. And it has any documentation whatsoever? I don't know. Let's go to the project site and it says you use it like that. Um, and an output helper, what's that? Oh, that's iTest output helper. I think that's optional. Um, Visual Studio is online. Are they? All right. Well, my thing automatically goes and hosts them. So I guess they're not part of uh, Live Coders. That's why they're not showing up on the Live Coders website. But that would be a good one. All right, so we go here and we take all these lines of code that we were doing before. Let's get rid of the damn breakpoint. Thank you. Um, we can do this instead and say result equals client dot get and deserialize to project list response with the path that I want to use, which is WAC projects and the output helper, which we'll say is null. Hopefully I've made it work for null. Um, or is there... Are there two of these? Do I make null optional? Hmm. Add the extension and find out. Output equals null. All right, good. So I don't have to pass it at all. So there's that. And then there's that's our result. So we can do control C on that. And we can run this test. And it's a one liner. And I think it's still green. All right, so we can delete all that and copy this and go over here and do the same thing. But now it's just this path, API projects. All right. And now we need this stupid innumerable of DTOs. But we can get rid of all that. And now it's a one-liner. Once we pull in the namespace. Anything else like that? Uh, kinda. But that one doesn't do anything. That one doesn't do anything. So that's good enough. Alright, so let's go here. Let's do this. Let's call it a day. Um, I still want to add a few more tests before I finalize this thing and, and publish a new template. I was hoping to get to that today, but but not so much, um, but I'll do that in my own time, perhaps this weekend. So when it's done, um, if we go back out to nougat.org, and we look for our Dallas, and we go find clean architecture, which probably could do a search for that. There we go, here's the template, right? So this template's gonna get updated. Um, probably to version 2, I'm guessing, because it's quite breaking. Uh, but you'll be able to install this template, and then you should be able to quickly create this project from .NET New. All right. Um, let's do a, another last commit, and then we'll say goodbye. So go over here, and what did we do? We fixed up a bunch of APIs, fixed some breaking integration tests, uh, wrote new tests, 
brought in I read only repository for hunt Jason. There now you're immortalized in my git history. Uh you still here? Yeah, you're still here. And that's probably enough. Uh, we also brought in uh, test extensions package. That's probably good enough. Push. Hehe. <laughs> um, all right. So it's after five on a Friday. Uh, it's time for me to go. So thanks, everybody. I will see you next time. Have a good weekend. Stay safe. Goodbye.